Okay, so welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Lecture two in the counting because the last one was more like an interim lecture since I was ill. So today we talk from RAN to P, but basically this should be an introduction to random variables and into probabilities a bit, but more a hands-on type of introduction. However, at the end, every notion that you learned is applicable, so it's not incompatible with what you learned. It's just maybe a repetition for most of you or a different perspective on the same thing, okay? I found it curious how to do it. So th I call this a computer scientist description of probability. Um, and it is compatible with the usual way to do things. So, and the key notion for me in probability are random variables, okay? So that's the first thing that one should get an intuition and I will also write down a definition, but the definition is a bit hand wavy. So here are some random variables. So basically for randomness, we need some sources of randomness, okay? And certain things th that we experience are random. For example, if I throw a dice, so suppose this is a dice and I could throw it, then the number of dots showing on the top, that's something random. In particular, I don't know it before looking at the dice, right? I might know it if I know the exact position of my hand and the exact position of the dice, and then I throw it, and then I principle could calculate it, and that's what's happening typically when you have a computer simulation, a physical simulation. Then typically, the exact same conditions will lead to exactly the same result. However, um, this is like a chaotic event, so if I move it a little bit, yeah, with a little different angle, then the outcome can be completely different. And in a way, the question is whether it's just a perceived randomness, so that we don't know it, what it is, right, because we cannot compute it, or whether it's real randomness. And at the end, real randomness basically, I think, happens mostly in quantum mechanics. So that's where you really have something that is really random. The other things, typically, often we just don't know exactly what it is. However, for then, in that case, randomness is, is useful too because we can use it to describe our non-knowledge of something. So the probability is giving us a possible description of what can happen. For example, if I have a dice, a fair dice with six sides, I could say each side has probability one six. And that doesn't tell me something about a concrete outcome, but it describes my knowledge that I have about dices and what to expect to see. Another example are the number of Higgs bosons after running the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so that's probably more related to quantum mechanics, how many particles I'm exactly counting after I'm letting certain things um, hit each other. That's also random experiments where I then at the end do some counting. Here's another random source, the rating of a certain movie that you watch, right? So in a way, it's also a random variable. Let's say you go to some website where you can rent movies, and before going there, you don't know whether QB got five stars or whether only four, or only one star, right? You don't know. You might have a prior distribution on that one, but it's in a way also a random event, where in this case, not like with the dice, many little variables like the exact 3D position and all these things play a role, for the rating of Kubrick's mu mu uh, movie, lots of human beings are playing a role who all type in their ratings, okay? And that's also reasonable to describe with randomness. <clears throat> There's also artificial sources of randomness. It's more like looker-like randomness. So it's not really random. Um, Pseudo-random -ran um, pseudo number generators, and they're even called pseudo-random because they are not really random. They really compute just a function. And I show you how it works. Let me first show you the implementation of the random function. So it could, for example, work like that. You have some, we define some function as rand, and you need a static variable here. So in Python, you can get a static variable <coughs> by just using this as rand like an object, and you define a new slot for it and set it to zero. And surprisingly, you can also use it inside the function. Okay, so you read it out, and you do some complicated multiplication and add some stuff. And then you calculate modulo some finite number, in this case, modulo 792. And then I divide by 792. So I will get a number between 0 and 1, OK, from this. And it's very hard to predict what's happening. Let's say you take the number 5, and you multiply it with a super large number, <coughs> plus this number. It's very hard to predict what the next number will be, OK? So it it's, looks quite random, yeah? for this. You need this hidden state variable. 
And in a way, that also makes it now questionable to call this function, right? So mathematically speaking, this is not a function because a function always gives you the same result when you give it the same input. And this random function doesn't have an input, so it should basically be constant. It should always give you the same result. However, we have a static variable, so it has a state, and so it can change its inner working. Another effect is like um, external effect that a function could have. Let's say you have a function that you program in Python and you have an input in the function, right? So that would be also some external effect which is affecting the behavior. In mathematics, a function should have with the same inputs always the same output. In computer science, we are more relaxed about it, right? So uh, a function in this case can also have a state and could maybe read a database or whatever, ask a sensor or something, and then it might have always a different value. So um, now a variable we would call now um, random variable if it gets the result of a source of randomness. So that is my hand wavy um, definition. So it's not really mathematical definition. It's more like my intuition about it, what a random variable is. It is some variable, x is typically the name of a variable, that gets assigned some um, random outcome basically, right? In programming, the random outcome is often the result of the function rand. Of course, we could also design a chip which probably which, which could have some some noise on it or something, some electronic noise, and then having real source of randomness in a computer. What we typically don't have that. I think you can buy a CD, a CD-ROM with random bits, and these bits they are really random, so they are like physically generated. And so if you want to have a real source of randomness, you can use the CD-ROM and run it once. And then you need another CD-ROM, of course, right? Because when you use the bits once, you shouldn't use them twice. So there is this real randomness, but typically it's okay to have like the pseudo-randomness. However, when we talk about um, causality and trying to measure like mechanics, me mechanisms in the world or something, then from our perspective, certain things are um, not clear, and so we say they are random, and we describe them with probability distributions. Um, here in our lecture, our random variables will be mostly real valued, yeah, including only integer valued or including only Boolean valued. Okay, so we keep it simple. But in principle, a random variable can be anything, right? It could be in functional programming, you could have a random variable that takes a function as its value, and the function is random. You have that, for example, by Gaussian processes in machine learning. They are basically you have a random variable which takes as a value a function. Okay, so that's no one stops you from doing this. Okay, so that's possible. In principle, we also define the range of a random variable, and that is a set of possible values. Okay, it's so simple. I talked about this one already. In Python, you can also import a random function like that. Yeah, so the function rand from this. Um, from numpy.random. I think there's also one in Python built in. So that is now the one that I looked at at the numpy function. And when you repeatedly call it, you get some numbers between 0 and 1. Um, looking back at this function, um, this one only has 792 possible values. right? Even, even though they look like be being something special between 0 and 1, or like you could hit any of them, you can only hit finitely many of them. And the same holds for this rand function, because in a computer you only have finitely many values between 0 and 1, right? We only have 16 bits, and with 16 bits we only have finitely many possible values. And so I guess the better implementation of the rand is not dif dividing by 792, but it's dividing by something like 2 to the 15 or 2 to the 16 or something. And then you are able to hit all of the possible values between 0 and 1, for example. But this is just now to get a feeling of what is randomness, right? Now, in the following, we will study the properties of these numbers. So there are these sources of randomness. So far, so good. We don't know, like with the dice, we don't know what's happening, or we don't know whatever the outcome of an experiment, will it rain in, in five hours or something like that. So this is all something that we would describe with random because we don't know it. In the computer, we, we make pseudo-random numbers. And now the question is, how could we describe it? And so the goal of the next stuff is to get an intuitive understanding of a PDF, what a probability density function is. So how could we describe the distribution? I gave already an example for a dice. We could say for the different outcomes, I write down numbers between 0 and 1 that should sum up to 1. But we can also experimentally go 
and play around with our rent function. So here I did it. I played around with the rent function. I um, called it 1,000 times and I made a histogram. Okay, so, so now what is a histogram? A histogram is basically now visualizing the outcomes of calling the rand function a thousand times. So here we basically count, so we had 60 times a number between 0 and 0 0.05 or something, right? So this bin, and then there's the next bin, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, and we just count how often we hit this. Okay, and there we see a couple of regularities. So they are like approximately having the same height. Okay, interesting. And there are two parameters, like the number of times I throw it and like the number of bins. I could also make fewer bins or more bins, okay? So let me show you first this one. So if I um, change the number of bins, my histograms would look like this, okay? So I could have only two bins, only from 0 to 0.5 and from 0.5 to 1. This giving me a very coarse picture of the situation. I could have lots of bins. Question? A bin. A bin. Oh, I mean a bin. Um, so... So my, so this is a bin, and it's basically, I don't know, what is it in German, a bin? Like, um, uh, let's say you have, you are now throwing um, balls from the top in here, okay, and those, those are the bins. So like, uh, schachteln or sowas? I guess something like schachteln. And so you have different schachteln for the different outcomes. Yeah, you know this? Let's say you have some nail on here, and then you have a nail on there, and you throw a ball, and it's jumping around, and then you, yeah, some of them will appear down here, some there, and maybe two over there, and basically then these, these are the bins. So in this case, we have four bins. Um, mathematically speaking, and I didn't switch the screen. Okay, so this was a super, super cool picture of a, of a golden board. And um, <coughs> basically, it also lets you kind of yeah, now visualize the outcome, right? Or let's say you are throwing ball from the top and you get points, and you see how many points you get. But more mathematically speaking, the bins are discretizing the continuous set of possibilities. So let's say this is 1, and this is 0. Yeah? Then um, basically, now we throw our or we call the function rand only, in this case, I don't know, 12 times or something. And these 12 times would give us 12 numbers some, somehow here. Okay? And that's kind of, that's not so easy to see what's going on here. And so what we are doing is we are discretizing it in four intervals, and then we count how many times we hit the different intervals. So, <coughs> I think this is also a bin, right? So the trash can, I think it's also called bin, yeah? So it's, it's just different possibilities. And so I can choose it here for visualization. I can have many bins, so 100 bins, or I can have fewer ones. And you see, when I have fewer ones, it's kind of smoother, yeah? Uh, when I have, and when I have too many, then it's very rugged, okay? In, in the extreme case, if I have 10,000 bins, then some of them only have height one and two, and some of them are zero. So not very informative. Here's the other effect. If I keep the number of bins constant and I increase the number of throws, the whole thing gets also more regular. Okay, so those are the two effects that I have here. Here's also, there was a question. So now, having seen this histogram, so how likely is it that my number is less than 0.5? And just by looking at it, I see that half of the time it was on the left of this 0.5 and half of the time it was on the other side. Okay, so I would say, probability is like 50-50 or 0 0.5, yeah? Um, so in principle, the height of the columns, they don't tell us so much, right? They depend on the number of times I'm throwing. So typically we're normalizing, okay? So we divide by the, by the number of times we throw everything here, okay? So in this case now, that normalizes the columns to be between 0 and 1 at the end, okay? Good, so we could increase the sample size and we see that it's getting more smooth, okay? And we could also increase the bins and that gets somehow more detailed, right? But also more rugged in this case, okay? More wiggly. 
Of course, suppose I put my number of bins to 100. Now, if I would increase further the number of samples, this thing gets flat again. Okay, so then it's kind of smoothing it out. So now it looks like this here's a curve kind of against which we are converging, right? When we are increasing the number of bins, making it large enough, and increasing the number of samples, kind of the whole thing gets very regular and it looks like this rectangular shape. And this orange curve here, that is then just the probability density function. And it kind of gives us a way to express how likely is it to hit one of these points. Yeah? But there are some subtleties here. But in principle, it means that it looks like anywhere between 0 and 1, it's equally likely. It has the same height. Okay? And that's what we are also experiment experiencing from our experiment. Um, so let's define a random variable as Python code. So here's Python code, set equals rand. This defines a random variable. If I run the code, I get the sample of an experiment. But if I don't run the code, I don't know much about it. I only know maybe the PDF of the distribution. Okay? So each time we execute the code, we might get a different result. Okay? So that's why the whole thing is random. The rectangular curve that I just described, we can also write down mathematically. It looks a bit overcomplicated, so basically what these brackets are telling us, it's 1 on the interval between 0 and 1, and it's 0 otherwise. Okay? And these things are also called Iverson brackets, and I'm a big fan of Iverson brackets. Iverson brackets work like this. You have these squared brackets, and you put a logical formula inside. So the A here is a variable which has a Boolean value, so it's either true or false. And so basically, then the Iverson bracket turns the true value into 1 and the false value into 0, like an indicator function. But it's a very useful notation, this one, because you can also um, algebraically manipulate it or you can drag in constants or stuff like that. So it's super useful. I got it from these books, The Art of Computer Programming, from Donald Knuth, so he likes it too. So that's where I copied it from. And it's, it's quite useful notation. Basically, it allows us to write this case distinction here just with one expression which is nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so that is our first random variable, and it's called uniformly distributed. So uniformly, all values are equally likely. Okay. So let's look at more properties. So we've seen that the PDF describes a histogram that is basically appearing when we sample a lot Okay, on the long run. In general, when we have a random variable, yeah, we can describe its randomness with a PDF, with a probability density function. And we would write it like this, ca a capital letter for the random variable. <clears throat> and then we have like P sub X with a capital X of a little letter X, yeah? where now this capital and little letter is a notation that you should get used to or should, should use. So the little X means it's a particular value from my random variable, and the capital X is the random variable. So the capital X is like an object that has a range and a spot maybe to store an element of that range, and it has a random, random distribution to it that describes its properties. And the X is then the actual value, <coughs> OK? So you could have a Gaussian distributed random variable, and you could have the value 5. And the 5 is a possible value for the Gaussian distributed random variable. Yeah. <coughs> OK, we can use other letters. So st statisticians or real statisticians, they, they sometimes also use F. Yeah, we always write P, which is a weird notation because sometimes we write P of X, and we mean the distribution for X. And sometimes we write P of Y, which is then the distribution of Y. Yeah, I will come to that later. So the notation is weird, but super useful. OK, so properties of a PDF is it must be non-negative. OK, so greater or equal than 0. Um, and this defines and also the range of x. Sometimes the, 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 um, the range is also only defined where this thing is greater than, uh, no, it's, it's called the support. So the support of x is typically called uh, the area where the, or the subset of the range of x where f of x is strictly greater than 0. OK, just how we probably learned it. So, Strictly greater than zero means that in principle it's possible to observe one of these values, right? And being equal to zero would mean that you never will observe it. Ah, oh, that's the next definition. Great. Okay. So it's a subset of the range where the PDF is greater than zero. 
Another property is the PDF must be normalized, so it must integrate to one. Okay? And that's just another convention. It doesn't have to be like that, but in principle, we would identify two PDFs which basically have the same support and the same shape, just a different height. We would say, you know, basically, we always assume that we are normalized. Okay? So far, so good. So a random variable is the result of something random. And if we look at histograms, we can study what's happening if we observe a lot of them and we learn something about the property of the randomness. And the randomness can be described with a PDF, with a probability density function. Okay, that's it. How do we get probabilities from this? Um, yes, back to this plot I asked already. So what is the probability that, oh, I didn't ask that question, but what about that one? What's the probability that Z is equal to 0.5? Any suggestions? It's a trick question. Yes, it's zero. Okay, so you know all this already. Very good. Yes, to hit it exactly, the probability is zero, right? So more meaningful is to ask, what's the probability of being in a certain interval? So this is a continuous random variable, which basically means it can hit any real number in there. We know it can only hit finitely many if we do it in the computer. But in general, we would say the real numbers between zero and one, any of them could be hit. And the probability of hitting each of them is basically zero. And you can try it, and you can run rand. You first write down a number between zero and one, like 0 0.123, and then run the program rand and wait until you exactly hit 0 0.123. It will take very, very long and might not happen in, during your lifetime, okay? So it can, can take very long. So the probability of getting a particular value is very small. However, st strangely, the PDF was non-zero, right, at 0.5. So the PDF is not giving us a probability, but it's only giving us the density. <coughs> and density is really something that is the same as density, like kilogram per something else. So for example, let's say, <coughs> oh, this is some, some metal piece or something, and it has a certain weight, and at each location, it also has a certain density. So I could say, how heavy is it per centimeter, right? So I could chop a piece out of this and I could say, what's the weight? And the density could also change if it's getting thicker over here, right? Then the centimeter that I would chop off would be more heavy. So the density here is higher. Typically in chemistry, we have like the density is like a change of material or something like that. And then the density changes because we have different material. Maybe this is plastic, it has a different density than over here where I have the ink, for example. Okay, so what I'm up to is probability density is really working very much like the usual density that you learned in chemistry or that you would have intuitively. However, here you are not measuring kilograms, but you are measuring probabilities, okay? And it's a different question what unit probabilities should have, definitely not kilograms, but also it's not clear what they should have. Yeah. Okay, so we can talk about intervals, right? So similarly here you could cut the cut the, the, this pen, an infinitely small piece out of this, and the weight of it will be zero, okay, if it's infinitely thin. And only if the interval is larger, then you get some positive weights. The same thing with probabilities here. Then we can also ask what's the probability of being less than 0.5. And here, if we say the probability of everything is one, right, then of being less than 0.5 will be 0.5 in this case, because it's uniformly distributed. This might sound super boring now, but it's like the simplest case possible to see all of this, right? Of course, it can get inter more interesting when I have a more interesting PDF. So probability is the area under the PDF. So that's the relation between probabilities and the probability density function. Here's another definition. So suppose now I have a real valued random variable with a certain PDF, then the probability that I am in a certain interval yeah, could be written as capital P for probability that kind of I'm in this interval. Now you might ask, so what am I allowed to write in these brackets if I have the capital P? And the answer is any logical formula that is true or false, okay, similar to the Iverson brackets. The Iverson brackets will evaluate it to zero and one, whether it's true or false. And this capital P will evaluate this expression into some number between zero and one, okay? However, 
only stuff that is measurable in here. So there's something with measurability where I say a bit about, but we don't worry too much about it. So there are some limitations. You can write down logical formulas where you cannot calculate the probabilities. But typically when we write down a formula here, there will be intervals or things like that. And they are all the back integratable and everything is fine. So everything is great here. So, and this is really defined to be the integration from A to B over the density function. And this integration is really like, um, let's take a more fancy distribution. Let's say, I mean, you know it already a little bit. So let's say you know already the Gaussian distribution, which looks like this. That's also a PDF. Okay, so this is an X. And this is another PDF. Let's call it F of X. Um, then an interval here, the area is basically could also again be measured in, as a weight, right? I can take a saw and I could chop it out of the blackboard or the whiteboard here. And then I would say the whole thing is equal to one. So I put it on a, on a, on a weight, or what is it called? A weight, a weight? What's the vague in English? A scale. a scale, okay. Oh, it's this thing, okay, so. I put it on a scale, the whole thing, I would say that is one, and then I put the small piece on the scale, and then I would get the proportion, and I know the area under the curve, assuming this thing is one <coughs> thickness. And this also stresses, so this density really is about the density. So it's really this intuitive thing, how it usually works. Okay, what else can we say? In principle, we can ask it, of course, for any subset of our range, right? And not every subset, only the measurable subset. There will be a slide on that in a second. But let's say I have a subset of my range, so not only an interval, but it could be the combination of two intervals or the combination of many intervals, and so on and so forth. And I could have the logical formula whether my random variable is inside of that one. Yeah, so this is now true or false, so I can calculate the probability. And it's just the integration over the set and now the key is just that you are able to do this integral. But we don't worry too much about it. That's measure theory. And I say a few words about it on this slide now. But all I say here is that you shouldn't be scared of measure theory and that it's just working like you want it to work. And the weird paradox are that they are in measure theory. They are not relevant for us. Okay, So we don't have to worry about it. So the sets that you can put in here or that you can integrate over they, have to, they are typically called measurable. And so I need to define the subsets of my range which are measurable, okay? And how am I doing it in measure theory? I do it with the so-called sigma algebra. This now looks fancy and you might have, know, have seen it already and you didn't like it or you know it all. On this slide, I just show you that it's simple, that there's nothing magic behind it. So it's basically about these integrals that I want to solve. And they should be defined for a certain set A. And it's only defined for the sets that are in this so-called sigma algebra. So now what is the sigma algebra? The whole range is in there. And the complement of sets is in there. And if I have finitely many already in there, then the union of these finitely many is also in there. However, that would be an algebra. I now want to define a sigma algebra. And the sigma means that I'm not only having finite sequences of sets, but I'm fine with infinitely many, but countably many sets. And the union of those should be also in the sigma algebra, okay? And then, for example, you could um, <coughs> take the, um, the Borel algebra, I think that's a famous one. I think that is built by taking all intervals and then combining unions of intervals and putting them all in there. This defines a subset of the power set yeah, of, um, so where is it? Where's my power set? Okay. So basically, I'm defining here a, a, a set of sets which are subsets of um, my range, okay? And this set of set is called sigma. Okay, and everything is there, the empty set is in there, and finite unions are also in there. And if that's the case, then the sigma is a sigma algebra. And now, the thing is, the key to, de to do this definition is that for all these special cases, I know how to calculate the integral. That's basically why the sigma algebra is defined how it is. So if I know already the measure 
the weight or the probability of A1, A2, and so on and so forth, yeah, then I also have a formula how to calculate it for an infinite union of those. Okay, that's kind of well defined with measure theory. So now a measure is just a function from this sigma algebra, so from the subset of the power set of my range into the real numbers. And an example is, for example, this probability distribution defined like this. That is, for example, an example of a measure. Yeah? And a measure is basically a way to measure things. So a measure is really the generalization of a yardstick, yeah? of a Zollstock. So a Zollstock can measure intervals, okay? And now the question in measure theories, what else can you assign a length? For example, can you assign a length to the coastal line of Finland or something? So those are difficult math questions def defining on, depending on you really define it, the coastal line. It could be a fractal or something. And then at the end, it might not be measurable, okay? So there are some subtleties. However, in your everyday life, when you are um, filling up your room with furniture and measuring stuff with a yardstick, everything is measurable. The good thing is everything we are doing with probability, everything will be measurable and we don't have to worry about sigma algebras and all of these things. Yeah? But this is just like some mathematics which tries to make the notion of length more rigorous. Okay? And it similarly applies to area and volume. So that's measure theory. And Length, area, volume, and probability is yet another thing we want to measure, okay? So now, why is measure theory nice? Why do mathematicians like it? So they like it because it's like a very general form to talk about this. Having a PDF, a probability density function, is a special case. Not all measures have a probability density function. So talking about measures is much more general than talking about PDFs. However, we usually talk about PDFs or even about probability mass function if we have a discrete random variable. So we keep it simple. But the theory behind it is nice, but um, it's good that, that it is there and it gives us some safe ground, but we don't have to worry about it. We just can use everything intuitively. Okay, now for what can we calculate probability? For everything that is measurable, okay? And what is measurable? All the elements in our sigma algebra are measurable. Okay, and that could be, for example, intervals and combinations of intervals. But everything we are talking about will be measurable. Okay, so far so good. So this is about probabilities. And I won't say much more about measure theory, so we, don't, we are not really dealing with the topic. Yeah? But it's only there to make put like measuring things on some solid ground. That's what measure theory is all about. Anyway, so we have PDF, we have now um, probabilities. Um, next step now is transformation. And here I'm talking about transformation of variables. That might be surprising. So that's like more a little bit an advanced topic in probability theory typically. But here I think it's super important in particular since we are computer scientists, right? We write functions, right? We say x is equal to rand and then we say f of x and we want to do a transformation of the x. So it would be nice to describe now the randomness of the result of the output of a function. Okay, so when you do programming, basically you are implementing transformations of simple stuff. Okay, so you start with some simple numbers and you do some complicated transformations with the for loop to compute something more interesting, like an approximation of pi or something. And so if we are talking about probabilities as computer scientists, transformation is the essential notion. The other thing is, in causality, as I showed you last time, um, like two, week ago, two weeks ago, um, it was about mechanisms, not only having correlations between variables, but knowing how can I compute giving one variable, how can I compute another one, or did it, was it the other way around? So it's all about formulas going from one variable to another one, and so it's important to understand how can I transform one variable in another one. And today we only look at univariate case, so only at simple real valued one. But it gets more interesting with the, for the multivariate case where you have like a vector of numbers and then you transform it with some nonlinear transformation and how is the density transforming. And there are for me also some open questions how to do it, but for some special cases we have some formulas how to do it. But today let's first look at the simple case in 1D. 
So here's a simple transformation. It takes a random, no, this takes a real number, z, okay, so the z is small, so it's a value from the real numbers, and I transform it like this, alpha times z plus beta, where alpha and beta are some real numbers. So I'm scaling it, and then I'm shifting it, okay, so that's, that's it. So now the question is, suppose I'm starting with my uniform random variable z, yeah, how is now this histogram transformed? And we can compute this. And let me just show you some code. So I also will put this code into the um, public folder. And th there's some simple stuff here. So I'm having some nice function for histogram. I'm for you to play around with the random function here that we just defined. And here are the histograms that I showed you. And now here is the transformation thing. So I'm saying I want to have n samples. I want to have b bins. I'm generating now, <coughs> excuse me, 10,000 samples from my uniform distribution. OK, great. And then I'm having here alpha equals 3, beta equals 2. And now I'm transforming my z into alpha times z plus beta. And I'm looking at the histogram. OK, and if we do that, we get this picture here. And now at first sight, you might say, oh, this looks identical. So nothing has changed. But if you look closely, then now here's a 2 and here's a 5. And before we had here a 0 and a 1. Okay, So basically now the range of this thing has changed. So the 0, if z is equal to 0, it basically gets mapped to 2. And if z is equal to 1, it basically gets mapped to 5. Okay, And in between, everything is like still equally likely. So it's a very simple um, transformation. Um, let's try to write down the PDF. Okay, So the axes have changed. So let's try to write it down. So um, the starting point might be that um, I can observe here from this picture that the x must be between beta and alpha plus beta. Okay, That's basically where it is. Um, however, the different, different point of view is that I transform it back. So since the z is uniform, I could also move the um, beta to the other side. Okay. So I take the result, which is now x, is a new random variable, which is a transform variable. I subtract the beta and divide by the alpha. And then I'm just using the uniform distribution that I had before. However, here's some funny divided by alpha here. And that's not so clear where it comes from. Yeah. Any ideas why there's a divided by alpha here? So it's not really coming here from the plugging everything in. So there's something missing. Why is it reasonable to have it? Any ideas? You can also say wrong things. That's fine. To get the integrals with the um, sum of one? Yes, exactly. Right. Otherwise, the height would be 1 if I wouldn't define by alpha. And then I would have the interval is 3 times 1. The, it would integrate to 3. And that's why I need to divide by 3. OK? So it's just a scaling factor. I need to rescale the PDF so that it integrates to 1. OK. But um, at the end of the lecture, we are able to derive this formula using the transformation of variable formula. Okay, So this has something to do with the derivative. Um, and this can be also written as 1 divided by alpha of the uniform PDF okay, of x minus alpha divided by alpha. That's just now falling from the sky. Okay, But it's a, it's a description of what's going on here. So this is basically what's happening. If the alpha is too large, okay. Um, the curve will be below 1, right? Because I have 3 times something, and the result should be 1. So it must be smaller than 1. So it will be 1 third, the height, right? Which is already approximately 1 third. And if my scaling factor alpha is less than 1, yeah, it could also happen that this PDF is larger than 1, OK? Larger than 1, again, is no problem, because the PDF is not the probability. The probability are now the, the area under the curve. And so if the interval is very small, the, the value of the PDF can be very large. Here's another interesting um, transformation, z squared. So what happens now? So that's getting more interesting. So basically, uh, uniform is between 0 and 1. So um, if I square it, it looks like everything gets kind of squashed towards the 0. So why is that the case? That's the case because uh, let's say you take 0 0.1 squared, that is 0 0.01, okay? So you're getting smaller numbers, 
Okay, one squared is one, okay, but 0 0.9 squared is 0 0.81. Okay, so you also get pushed towards zero. So that's why this now looks a bit skewed here, okay? And also here one can show that there's a certain formula that describes this curve exactly, okay? Now, this is typically the natural way to describe what the computer program is doing, right? So we have a transformation, or this could be also a deep neural network, right? So a deep neural network could transform a vector into a different one, and it, so it would transform one distribution into another one. That's basically what GANs are doing, yeah? these generative adversarial networks. They're taking a certain base distribution and they turn it into distributions where when you reshape it to an image, it looks like bedrooms or whatever, yeah, or faces. And there are also these diffusion networks. They basically all work with this idea that the neural network is making a complicated transformation. And by this, in principle, expressing a very complicated probability distribution. We also see, so this is a dis possible way to describe basically the randomness now of the result, but the transformation is another way to describe it, okay? If I fix the uniform distribution as the input, then my transformation is fully describing what's going on, okay? But sometimes a bit impractical because I can only put examples in and I get a result. Uh, yes? Yeah, this is the thing. This is something I'm also confused with. So here's a, uh, this is zero thing, right? So here I put a, a disk, meaning that I never will reach the one, right? But here the, the one is, looks like infinity, which is kind of weird. So I would exclude it, yeah? So better we exclude it. I would say the density should be zero. So let me write it down better on the, um, on the screen. So let me, so what is it? Square root of x. Square root of x divided by 2x. Okay, you need to memorize that one. Okay, so, so this new distribution p of x square root of x divided by x, and I had here, I have written it like that, right? And it's better to do it. And then it's fine. So it basically means, okay, if x is zero, then the whole thing is zero, so you don't multiply with this weird thing, okay? It's a bit hand wavy. So better in this case would be if then else. So better would be, this is equal to zero for x uh, less than or equal to that one and square root of x divided by x for x greater than zero Then here we write or x is greater to one. Okay, so that's more precise. Way. But it's good. These corner cases say that's something important to look at. Definitely, yeah. So that's always curious. <coughs> okay. Now again, this new curve here. This now <coughs> looks more interesting, and it, it describes what 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 to expect. What values are probably are probable? Yeah. So the larger the values, the more probable they are. So probability again is zero to hit each of them, but like the intervals that I can calculate under the curve, they will tell me the probabilities for different intervals. And of course, an interval over here is much more probable than an interval over there, okay? Great, so far so good. Um, let's make it now more general, okay? So those were special cases. Let's get to the special, uh, to the general formula for transforming a PDF. So the starting point is we are given a random variable x, which means we are also given some PDF for it, okay? And now we have a transformation of x, defining us a new random variable. Again, so this is not a little x, but this is a capital X, so I'm plugging in the random variable at the location where the transformation would typically take a value. And this defines me a new random variable, right? Why is that random? That is random because x is random in this case. The t itself is deterministic, okay? That is just a function. Um, now the question is, what is this p of z? Okay, and we want to look at a, like, how to derive it, and we try to do it intuitively. So we have a so-called desideratum. So the desideratum means just something we want, yeah? but it sounds nice in Latin, but it's basically something that we wish for. Okay, and we want that the probabilities should stay the same. 
under a monotonic transformation. Okay, so suppose we have a monotonic the non-decreasing t, yeah, so some function like x squared or something like that, then we want that the probability that x is in the interval a, b should be the same as the transformed value t of x being in the interval from t of a and t of b. Okay? That's a very reasonable assumption to have. Probabilities shouldn't change. Why? Because the t is really deterministic. So it's really same input, same output in this case. And now we can replace the t of x, of course, with the z. Okay? So that's basically our desideratum, that what we have. Now let's use that and derive the formula. So the, this probability here is the integral from a to b over my PDF of x, and I integrate over the x. Yeah. Then um, my desideratum is this thing over here. So the probability now integrated over the z with the new PDF that I don't have of z, but now with the new um, points at the beginning and at the end, so t of a to t of b. So this should be the same as that one. So that was what I'm wishing for, yeah, what my transformation formula should fulfill. And then I can use the um, integration by substitution rule. Okay, this is something like MAFI 17, or I don't know when you learn it, MAFI 2 or something, MAFI 1, um, that you can change basically the variable in here, yeah, when you have a transformation, and you can replace the z by the t of x, and you can replace the bounds by the inverse applied to the bounds, but you need to multiply with the um, derivative. But I should push this thing down. Okay, thank you. Um, teaching is really multitasking. I never, I don't know whether you have ever tried it, but teaching and recording is really a lot. And I also tried once teaching, recording, and streaming. And so this is horror. So this is really very, very demanding. Um, OK, so the first equality is what we wish. And the second equality is just integration by substitution. Yeah, And of course, this derivation up here, I made it in such a way so that it's fitting nicely down here into this formula. OK? But it is the thing that you really want. So that is really what the probability should stay the same, even if you do a transformation. That's what, should, what you should do. And now, as you know, I'm, I'm always, I like to hand, wave my hand. Hand wavily now, I can read off the PDF formulas, right? I could say P of x is equal to this guy over here. So now I have a relation between my density of x and my, re my density of z. Great. However, am I done yet? No, unfortunately, I have the formula the wrong way around, right? So suppose I'm having already the density of z and I'm having the transformation. Then this formula down here, this one down here, is telling me how to get the density of x. But actually, I wanted to have it the other way around. OK? So this is already partially right. And it's nice to read and nice to understand, but not exactly what we want. So let's. Um, ah, there's some intermediate question. Let's go back to the intermediate question later. So far, we got this. However, we want to do it backwards. And we now do just exactly the same thing, but backwards. But then all the formulas get more ugly, and the integration by parts looks more ugly, and everything doesn't look so nice identifiably. identifiably. So let's do it backwards. Let's assume our transformation t is now invertible. So there exists a function t to the minus 1, yeah, which is just the inverse of t. Okay, So in both ways. And doing it backwards now means that we now define x to be t to the minus 1 of z. So we start with z and generate the x. And then we just copy the formula from the previous slide, but exchange the roles of x and z. And then we get this formula. And this is a typical formula for the transformation of variables that you know maybe from another lecture. Okay? So given a distribution for x, given a transformation from x to z, you have to pl plug in <coughs> the inverse of t twice and the inverse of the derivative in here. But I think this is hard to understand and this is hard to derive. And so that's why I think it's better first to think about it the other way around. Um, let's combine all this into a big theorem. So here's our big theorem. So we have x and we have z being t of x. 
And then between the PDFs, we have the following relationships, and those are just the formulas that we just seen. Okay, and this derivative I can also rewrite uh, like this dz divided by dx, which will be useful in a second, because the question is always, so how do you memorize this formula? So this is typically the formula uh, that you need to memorize that is kind of hard, right? To the minus one or not, and which is the derivative. But there's a, tri there's a, a simple thing how to memorize it nicely. Either you memorize the other one, so that's a simpler one in my opinion, or you use Leibniz notation for derivatives. So what do I mean by that? So another way to say integral should stay the same is to say that density ma times some interval on the x-axis, so the dx is an interval on the x-axis, this product should stay the same if I change to a different variable and take the corresponding interval on the z-axis. Yeah, so if you put at the integra integration sign here, yeah, then it's really saying the probabilities with respect to x shouldn't change if I transform to z, okay? But you can also just view it like a little rectangle. So this is the side length of the rectangle and this is the other side length of the rectangle. And after the transformation, yeah, the area should stay the same, okay? Maybe the intervals change because of scaling or something, but um, the result should stay the same. So now Leibniz notation for, for derivatives is just dz divided by dx. I think physicists like it a lot. They use it all the time. In this case, it's also super useful to do it like that because now if you just um, move the dx to the other side, you get the formula up here. And if you move the dz to the other side, you get the formula down here, approximately, okay? But that's a nice way to memorize it. Okay, I skipped a little detail. So why is here an absolute value? So that was kind of weird, right? So why is there an absolute value? Any ideas? So let's think of the scaling one, alpha times x. Okay, what's the derivative of alpha times x? It's alpha. Okay, so what's happening if I wouldn't have an absolute value here? Any ideas? It could get negative, right? So the alpha, let's say alpha is equal to 2, fine, derivative is 2, everything is great, but let's say minus 2, okay? So I could also do that. So I could multiply my uniform distribution with minus 2, what will happen? I get a uniform distribution from minus 2 to 0, right? but the density should still be positive, okay? And it's only about the volume change, okay? And it's not about the, um, the, the sign of it. By the way, volume, speaking of volume change, this is, of course, a special case of the determinant, right? This absolute value of the, um, the derivative will be, in more general speaking, it will be the absolute value of the determinant of the, what is it called, Jacobian matrix. Okay, but this is now the special case. Okay, so there are decreasing and non-decreasing function, but the integration, um, so we don't want to change the sign. Okay, that's why we need the absolute value here. Okay, so far so good. So for you, what I may remember from these slides, what I could just write down is this one. And that's the essential thing that you say the integral should stay the same, so the probability should stay the same. And from that one, you can derive all the formulas that you want. Okay, good. Now let's look at our linear transformation and let's use the formula that we just derived. Okay, so here's our linear transformation. I'm, I'm using this Iverson bracket notation, which I, I enjoy a lot. Now applying my formula means P of X of the inverse transformation of Y, okay, times the absolute value of the inverse derivative of this thing. So now what is the inverse function? The inverse function is y minus beta divided by alpha. Okay, y minus beta divided by alpha. And the derivative of y minus beta divided by alpha is 1 divided by alpha because that is the factor in front of the y. Okay, that's why I'm having here for the derivative 1 divided by alpha. Okay, and t to the minus 1 of y, that is just y minus beta divided by alpha. Okay, so that is the answer. And of course, now I could also rewrite it a little bit. I could, I could do things like 
multiply by alpha this inequality, right? Then I have alpha times zero, so I have a zero over here, and I have y minus beta, and here I have alpha, and then I could also move the beta to the other side. I could say beta less than or equal to y less than or equal to alpha plus beta. That was the thing that I had on the previous slide. But the important thing is one divided by alpha is doing the proper rescaling. And you see here, so mathematically speaking, where does it come from? It's coming from integration by parts. Yeah? So that's basically where this um, derivative comes from. Okay, that's it. Nonlinear transformation, same thing. So let's look at the example. Again, let's write down the formula. And the inverse of the square root is, uh, the inverse of squared is the square root. Okay, so I plug it in here. And then the derivative of the square root, so it's y to the one half. And the derivative of that one is y to the minus one half times a half. So this is the one half, it's the two down here. And the y to the minus one half can be also expressed as y to one half minus one. And that's why we have like square root of y divided by y. If you like the other one, you could also replace the y by square root of y times square root of y, and then you cancel out one of the square roots. Okay, so far so good. It's not easy to follow from the words, right? I could also write it down. You should interrupt me if it's if I'm too fast with it, but I can also repeat it or put it on the board. But I think this is simple stuff. Now, of course, which one is preferable? Is this one preferable or that one? By the way, how do you get from here to here? Anyone knows? So why can I omit the square root here? What is that? What trick is that one? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah, so the truth value doesn't change. So under the Iverson bracket, sometimes you can do some funny operations which are not so obvious. But you can just omit the square root. It doesn't change the interval. Totally right. But it changed the distribution. But it's irrelevant for the Iverson bracket. The Iverson bracket just wants to have true and false. And it doesn't care for a PDF or something. OK, great. Let's look at other interesting examples. So here's another one. Let's say we have some um, ran real. So this is like a puzzle. So we have a real valued random variable, and we have a uniform distributed variable. So why am I always talking about uniform? Because that's, we have it, rand. We can use it in a computer, right? So now the question is, can I transform my rand into x? So what function t would transform my z into an x? So that's an interesting question. Yeah. Does anybody know already? Only if you've seen my other lectures. So there I'm also doing it. Any suggestions? Yeah? Maybe the PDF of X? Yes, something like that. I'm glad you didn't say the true solution yet, but it's, it's, it's something like that. Um, it is something about the PDF, but it will be the CDF. So it's uh, the cumulative distribution function. Okay, let's, let's get the answer to this puzzle. So this is useful, right? So this is also useful for deep learning. I, I mean, you, you um, having a big point cloud, unlabeled data, right? Some, let's say, a data set of digits or something. And you want to have a generator that takes random noise that you generate with RAN, and a neural network which transforms the random noise such that you get the digits, right? So that's exactly this what we're doing here, OK? So <clears throat> to do this, we first need to define the cumulative distribution function. In German, Verteilungsfunktion. By the way, probability density in German is Dichtefunktion, OK? So that's one. And so the cumulative distribution function, that's the Verteilungsfunktion. In English, one often abbreviates these things, and you say PDF or CDF, OK? So that's like the common Sprech in English. So the cumulative distribution function now for a one-dimensional real-valued random variable is defined to be the probability yeah, that the random variable is less than or equal to a certain value. Again, here the notation is really useful, right? So the f, the cumulative distribution function, is a function of all the values from the range, so little x, OK? And the little x also appears in this expression. And the inner expression x being less than or equal to x, it's a Boolean expression. It's either true or false. 
and even if it's an interval, so we will be fine with calculating probabilities. And we can even directly write down the integral if we have a PDF for that one, okay? So just the integral from minus infinity to x. <clears throat> we also put a capital X down here just to say that is the CDF of my random variable x. Yeah? I could have put it also, um, oh, I don't do it for the probability because the probability is applicable to anything Boolean. And in this Boolean expression, there might be some random variables. And then this will determine what I need to compute. But it's not like a special property of the p. The little p is a PDF. It also gets a subletter in this case. <coughs> However, we often omit this stuff if it's clear what we are talking about. Now, this cumulative distribution function has some interesting properties. First of all, it's right continuous. So that's like a weird property. So that's basically meaning coming from the right, yeah, I always hit the value I'm converging against. So what do I mean by that? So that basically means if I have, um, let's take the uniform distribution. OK, I haven't now exactly specified whether this point is in here or not. But for the CDF, it doesn't matter. The CDF is now the, so this is the PDF, so u of x. And this would be the CDF of little x, OK? So basically, it's the integral from minus infinity of my PDF okay, up to a certain point. So up to this point, minus infinity to here, the area under the curve is 0. Okay, so nothing is happening until I hit that point over here. Okay, now what is happening over here? So now I'm increasing, and I'm slowly increasing up until here, and then I stay up there. Okay, so that is the CDF. <clears throat> okay, that is not a nice example for being discontinuous. Um, actually, now I'm struggling how to get one. Uh, yeah, okay, it's not so applicable for the examples that we've seen so far. So let's first understand that one. So by the way, so this is the integration. Um, the thing is, this is the constant function. And if you know, as you know, when you integrate the constant function, the Stammfunktion, or the antiderivative in English, is x, is the linear function, which is just that one. So this is just how the thing ramps up. And then it's constant one, once I'm, I enter the area. OK? So now, if I would have a density which has like some infinite jump, yeah, but this infinite jump is no fun, then it could happen that my um, PDF jumps up to here as well, up to 1. But this is a bit strange. So this is the so-called delta function. And the delta function is a weird beast. It's like infinitely high up here at this location, yeah, and 0 everywhere else. But if you integrate over it, then basically the integral of the whole thing will be 1. So it's a strange function. It can be seen like the limit of such a function where you make the whole thing even more and more narrow. But in that case, your distribution function could look like this, meaning that if you converge from the right-hand side towards this jump point, you will reach the value at that point. But when you go from the left-hand side to this point, the limit will be 0, right? Because the values are all 0, but the value will be 1. So it's not left continuous, but it's right continuous. But it's a bit mathematical property that we don't worry about. So we are more looking at these nice ones, OK? So we don't have to worry about it too much. It's just a mathematical <laughs> property here. Uh, the infinite uh, going until <coughs> minus infinity, of course, the integral will be 0 because we don't cover anything. And going against plus infinity, it converges against 1. And then it's monotonically increasing, or with better words, it's non-decreasing. It never goes down. It can stay constant for a while, and then it goes up again, or it can even have jumps in certain cases. But it's, in principle, non-decreasing, OK? And the main reason being that the density is non-negative, right? You can only go down if you have a negative density. But density is always positive. Other property, yeah, the probability can be also expressed with the CDF. So you can also express it like this. And when you, when you see this, and this is the Hauptsatz of the Integral und Differentialrechnung, I think. So basically that the 
integration from A to B can be written with the antiderivatives, with the Stammfunktionen. Is it the Hauptsatz? Maybe. Something like that. Okay? So this is all like the simple known stuff. Now an interesting fact is the derivative of my CDF is my PDF. Okay, that's a curious fact, right? But in principle, I mean, the slope, the, the slope how, how strongly my CDF is increasing is exactly defined by the PDF. Okay, that's just the close relationship between those ones. Okay, so now let's try that one. So what's happening if I transform my X now with my CDF? That's weird, right? But the CDF is just a function, right? So let's see. So this was just a function. I mean, it had this little letter sub X in here, and that was defining what PDF I'm using, but in principle, it is just a function of X. So why not plug in a random variable? And this defines me a new random variable, right? So it's transforming my random variable. And let's see what I get. Um, so now what is the PDF of Z? Let's use our transformation formula. So this is our transformation formula. I, I omitted the absolute value here and just plugged everything in. Okay, so the p of x, f to the minus 1 of z, so that's something I cannot simplify because I don't know the px, so I just leave it where it is. And then here I'm having the inverse cdf and the derivative of z1, okay? And here I'm claiming that it's p of x, blah, blah, blah. So this is a bit, this is a miracle step here, and you get it from the inverse function theorem, okay? So the inverse function theorem says, if you have a function with the right properties, then basically the derivative of the inverse function is one divided by the derivative of the function. And this can be very simply seen by drawing the graph of f and then mirroring at the axis, and then basically that, that's approximately the proof. So let's say you have some function like this, and um, let's say this is the origin, and now I take the mirror image of that one. Yeah, and the mirror image is exactly the inverse function, like this. And then one can see that the relationship between the derivatives is exactly one divided by the other one. Okay, so you can see this with the graphical mm -hmm. proof if you are not believing it. Okay, how are we using it? We are using it like that, that we say, <coughs> excuse me, the f basically is, the little f is the capital F. Okay, and here we are interested now in the f inverse derivative, that is the f inverse derivative, okay? And now this function is telling me that is one divided by the derivative of f at the location a, okay? There we have to be careful. Now, the derivative of my cumulative distribution function is the PDF. That's great, so we get the p of x down here. But we need to rewrite the a as well but the a can be written, rewritten as the inverse f to the minus 1 of b, which is exactly this thing down here. Okay? And then the quotient cancels, I get a 1. So now what did I get? So I learned if I have a random variable x with any distribution, and here any means having the right properties, but the properties are just the usual ones that we always have, that it's nice and blah, blah, blah. If I then take the cumulative distribution function and generate and define a new random variable, then that will be always be uniformly distributed, which is somewhat surprising, isn't it? I mean, it really means if I, um, um, if suppose you sample from a Gaussian distribution, yeah, lots of samples, and you look at the histogram, you get a Gaussian distribution. Okay, great. And then you nonlinear transform it by pushing it through the cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian. You will get a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. It's not completely surprising because the CDF is defined between 0 and 1, right? So the outcome is always a number between 0 and 1. However, it's surprising that it's really uniformly distributed. Okay, how does it help us with our puzzle? It helps us, maybe we have to do it the other way around. Okay, so given this setup, and we have uniform samples z, yeah, we need to transform it with the inverse 
cumulative distribution function and then we get samples from p sub x. Okay? And that is indeed the case. So, um, ah, this is just written down as a theorem. Okay? So that was what we just shown. But now our initial problem is what function does the job that we want and I claim now it is exactly the inverse CDF that is doing this what we want, okay? So let's try that. So we start with a uniform distributed Z and we nonlinear transform it with the inverse. So does the inverse exist? Yeah, I think in most cases it's fine because of the properties of having right inverse and these kind of things. Probably the inverse is defined with an infimum in there or something. So there must be some thing to deal with these flat areas, okay? Probably we take the smallest value for a flat area. So the inverse of such a function can be a bit funny, but with using the minimum or infimum, we will be fine. I will define it in a second. Let's first now use our formulas and see what the PDF of y is. I call it y here, but at the end, it will be the exactly the same distribution as x, okay? Because I'm here using this sub x, but let's call it for now y. So applying our formula, um, I'm having here the p of z and then I have my the inverse transformation. However, the inverse transformation was already the inverse. So the, trans the inverse transformation of the inverse is just the CDF of z1, okay? Times the derivative of z1. Okay, now the CDF of a function is always between 0 and 1 and the PDF of my random variable p of z is a uniform distribution. So this term here is equal to 1 for the interesting things. Yeah? So this term can be omitted. It disappears because it's always constant 1, no matter what the input here is. Okay. The second term, the derivative of my CDF is my PDF. And bingo, that's it. So by that we showed that the p of y is exactly the p sub x. Okay? This, I think it's a nice result. So what we learned is if we want to sample from any distribution, yeah, where you are given the PDF, yeah, derives the CDF, calculates the inverse, and then you have the transformation. I think it's an interesting connection between PDFs and transformations, but it's a non-trivial one. With other words, if you now do um, train a gun, a generative adversarial network, and you have a uniform distribution here, and you train it with the um, gun algorithm and it works very well, basically what you learned is the inverse cumulative distribution function of your distribution that you're trying to learn, okay? So now this gives you an insight in what the, your neural network is doing. And sometimes these distributions give you new insights and then people come up with diffusion networks which are even pushing this stuff even further. And it's coming from this kind of reasoning, okay? So the inverse CDF has a name, yeah? I always thought it's called inverse CDF, but then someone came up, by the way, there's even a Wikipedia entry on it, and it's called quantile function. Okay, quantiles function. Okay, great. It kind of makes sense because the inverse CDF is telling you um, the input of the inverse of the quantiles function is a number between 0 and 1. And so you could, for example, put 0 0.9 into the quantiles function and it will tell you at what value kind of you reach 0 0.9 of the probability or something, right? So basically the inverse quantiles function is telling you something like this. <clears throat> Suppose here you are 0 0.9, okay, and now the question is what value on the x-axis kind of covers 0 0.9 of the thing? So which is like a quantile type of thing, yeah? Good, it's always nice if things make sense. And um, the quantiles function gets a name, so you can write it with q sub x, okay? It's nicer than f to the minus 1 sub x. And you can also define it very precisely. So you take the infimum over all values x such that z is less than or equal to f, f of x, which is basically saying take the smallest value as the result, so the smallest of the x's such that I have reached 
basically the, the given um, value z, the, the given quantity z. Okay, that's why there's an infimum. Infimum, if you if you don't like it, so if it's too complicated, just think of a minimum. So that's that's also okay. I think in this case even it's fine because the f of sub x is it's continuous from the right, and if it's continuous from the right, I guess the minimum is the same as the infimum, maybe. But it's long ago, so don't worry. So infimum is like minimum, very similar. Okay, so far so good. Uh, we are almost at the end for today. So let's see. Let's take a Gaussian distribution and let's just play around a little bit what, with what we've learned. So, so can we find a transformation that transforms a uniform distribution into a standard normal Gaussian distribution? So that would be nice, right? Then we can just program now our rand n function. So there's this rand n function that samples from a Gaussian distribution in NumPy. And so we have rand already. So this would... So rand we implemented with this modulo operation thing, getting random numbers between 0 and 1. If we would get this transformation, then we could also generate Gaussian distributed numbers. That's, that would be nice. So let's see how it goes. So first of all, let's calculate this, the CDF for Gaussian distribution. So it gets the name phi, typically. So that's what people write for the CDF of Gaussian. And it's this <coughs> integral. Unfortunately, when you look at the result, the result has here some other ugly function, the erf. So what is the erf? The erf is the error function. And it's basically defined to be exactly this. So it's defined to be the proper in this integral, which is very hard to solve. So it's an integral of e to the minus x squared. And the integral of e to the minus x squared is somehow not easy to calculate. So there are some difficulties, I think, to do. Um, at least you can calculate it from minus infinity to plus infinity. That's fine. Yeah? Then you get something with pi or something, the normalization constant of the Gaussian distribution. But when you want to evaluate up to a certain point, then the integration is very difficult. Okay? That's very hard. And so it gets a name. Yeah? Like always, like gamma function, gamma function or beta function, those are super ugly functions. They just you have an ugly function derived, so you give it a name. And then you can forget about it, and you just use its properties. Similarly here, so here's the error function. Anyway, so this is the error function. It is exactly this integration, and there is no closed form solution as far as I know, okay? And now having this error function, I mean, do we have it? Yes, surprisingly, yes. If you look it up in PyTorch or in NumPy, you will find someone implemented for you the error function. And sometimes it's implemented by having a table lookup even, right? So they just have a big table where they look it up and then interpolate or something. And having the error function now, uh, we can say the inverse or the quantized function is the inverse of this guy. So it's the inverse of the phi. And it can be also written as the <coughs> inverse error function. Next question, you Google for inf erf. And the inf erf, of course, also exists in NumPy and in all these things. So it's all implemented, so you could use it. Of course, generating random numbers from a random Gaussian distribution is also already implemented. But nonetheless, it's nice to understand the connections between these things. So this could be used, but there's a much better one called box Muller method. There's some more fancy one that is generating much faster. It is fast, faster than calculating the error function. So there are more quicker ways to generate random numbers than using the error function. So people are not using this one, but another one. Anyway, that's it for today. Um, I hope you got some insights. Maybe some stuff was repetition for you. But maybe this transformation thing and the uniform distribution, the connection to the cumulative distribution, that's something that was at least new to me. Um, when I first learned about it. So hopefully you got something out of this. Next week, we will look at multivariate distributions. And we also want to look at the multivariate um, transformation formula. And that one is a bit more fancy. And there are also some open questions where I don't know how to do it. But in some cases, I know how to do it. That's where the ones that I can show you. And the other ones that I don't know, maybe one of you want to find out how to do it. So if you have a link for me, I will put it into the lecture. But let's wait for that for next week. Okay, so thanks for your attention. That's the end of today.